what you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. With me on the line on America Trends is Philip Mudd. Many of us see him on CNN regularly, but before he started to commentate, he's the former deputy director of the CIA's Counter Terrorist Center and the FBI's National Security Branch. And Philip, you decided to let us in because we haven't really had a great understanding of black sites. Uh, the CIA in the post 9-11 world. And of course, Black Site, which is the title of the book, uh, represents where a number of these high value prisoners went. And uh, what happened internally in the decade after the attacks where we have so rarely discussed or seen written about what was really going on during this period? What you really had was a transformation in the sort of philosophy of counterterrorism after 9-11, which is where some of the, the, the book gets into the details of black sites and secret interrogation facilities. What happened was, you know, the surrounding uh, psychology was with people saying, this can't happen again. We cannot have another 9-11. We can't have people jumping out of buildings and nearly 3,000 people dead from 19 hijackers. So in the midst of that turmoil, and I try to take the reader back to give him a sense of what it was like, you have the capture of the first al-Qaeda prisoner in the spring of 2002. At that point, going into the summer of 2002, the CIA officials that I worked with and spoke to for the book sat and said, look, this prisoner doesn't want to speak, and he knows about al-Qaeda, which the CIA did not have great intelligence on. So the question was, do we send them, him back to the U.S. judicial system where he'll get a lawyer, or do we put him in our own facilities overseas and interrogate him? It was a fateful decision, but in the tenor of the times, the real – through the – through those years and the first few years after 9-11, the real, one of the real takeaways was the CIA reading the American people to say, make sure this doesn't happen again and take, take whatever measures you need to take within U.S. law to make sure it doesn't happen again. It was really a philosophical shift after 9-11, psychological shift. And how important is it today to remind us of this? Because I think a lot of people look back and we forget uh, how tremulous that period was, how concerned we all were, and how we imagined that another attack was just on the horizon. It's interesting you ask that. You would, th this is a, just a tiny sliver of history. It's not a history book. It's more me talking to my former colleagues and trying to recreate for the reader a sense of the time, if you will, to put the reader in the driver's seat. So there's half of this that I think it's important for Americans to remember. This is who we were less than a generation ago. There is a piece of this that I don't talk about much i don't usually get asked about it but i want to remind americans that when you're in a time of great stress and we haven't seen that stress during this intervening 18 years but when you're in a time of great stress look at this as a learning exercise and ask yourself what you would do how you would react under stress are you sure you'd make different decisions if you don't like what the cia did why were so many people who actually had to deal with the threat why did they act differently i think it's a it's a cautionary tale for anybody going through high stress decisions and trying to make decisions, looking back, if you will, like history will look back on them. It's, it's a cautionary tale. And you remind us that after 9-11, the CIA moved from an intelligence operation to a war fighting operation. I think many of us probably don't understand what the CIA was before 9-11 and what it really became. But let me give you two conversations in the Oval Office. Uh, these are notional conversations. One would be going back to the history of, of the CIA before 9-11. Mr. Director, can you, can you talk to me? Now it's Ms. Director, but that, at that point it was all Mr. Director. Mr. Director, can you tell me about big, slow-moving threats, how the Russians are developing improved missiles, how the Chinese are slowly developing their own missile program, how Iran is building potentially a nuclear program, what's happening with political instability in Latin America? Very big, slow-moving strategic questions. And note that on none of those, does the CIA have responsibility for doing something about the problem? In each of those, the CIA is supposed to explain the problem 
And somebody else, like the U.S. military, has to develop a countermeasures program for Russian missiles. Fast forward after 9-11. Mr. Director, can you tell me about whether you can find John Doe the terrorist 10,000 miles away? And you can, can you find him with such granularity that you can stage a raid operation tomorrow? Very, very fast-moving and tactical. And then that fateful second question, yes, Mr. President, we can find John Doe. Okay, Mr. Director, can you take the action? Can you conduct a raid? Can you work with a sister service around the globe to conduct a raid? The type of intelligence, the fast and tactical change, and the results, the CIA was supposed to do the action, not just provide the information change. It was like, it was like a, just a tremendous shift at the agency. And how much of this, of course, can we attribute to the need to have known more beforehand about Osama bin Laden? And how elusive was he as an example of how difficult it was to accumulate uh, human assets on the ground and uh, the intelligence that we needed uh, to forestall what happened? Well, I mean, part of the, the, the problem, as you're describing, was an intelligence problem. Uh, the intelligence picture before 9-11 wasn't great. But part of it was a simple question of risk, like every organization faces. I think there are lessons in the book for organizations under stress, by the way, beyond the counterterrorism world, obviously. But even if you have the fidelity of intelligence to tell you this is where bin Laden is, are you going to risk a U.S. military raid? Are you going to risk a, a missile strike that could kill a lot of civilians? Would you ever consider arming a drone so that you're starting to kill foreign terrorists overseas? When I interviewed my friends and colleagues about the pre-9-11 period, they, they all talked about those questions, and their answer was, regardless of the intelligence picture, there was no risk appetite in the United States to conduct operations like a raid against the bin Laden compound, or God forbid, a drone strike against bin Laden himself. That was simply inconceivable. That changed within, you know, two hours on September 11th. It changed overnight. You also reminded us that during this period, uh, we had a new administration coming in. And the new team wasn't ignoring terrorism. They were just on a learning curve. And, of course, this prompted a much faster learning curve, if you will. I think that's right. If, if you look at uh, – I was at the National Security Council. That's sort of the advisory component, the foreign policy advisory component at the White House. I was serving in the executive office building, which is right across from the West Wing. And I remember a lot of conversations sponsored by or sparked by Vice President Cheney about missile defense. The world is uh, – Iran would be a good example. And now North Korea is developing more and more missiles that might be capable of reaching America. We need to focus on missile defense. People talked about terrorism, and clearly behind the scenes there were more conversations than we knew about from the CIA and down including the White House. But there was a learning curve, as there is for any new administration. And there was another bigger issue that I think whether you're George Bush or Barack Obama, if you've been there at that time, or Bill Clinton would face, and that is once we see this threat, who is going to sit there and say, well, I've decided, despite the fact that we haven't faced an attack, to invade Afghanistan or to begin a series of very aggressive raids? I think even if the intelligent picture were better, I'm not sure how many American presidents would have said, well, forget about missile defense. I'm going to turn on a dime and, face, and, and focus on these terrorists by invading their country overseas. I'm not sure what intelligence would lead a president to do that in advance of the tragedy of 9-11. You remind us that it was 1986 when the Counterterrorism Center was born, and it put these analysts and operators side by side. What was the significance of that development as we move forward? Every organization has its culture. You know, I've never been involved in manufacturing, but I got to believe the engineering guys and the sales guys have very different <laughs> different cultures. In the CIA, that's the equivalent of the field guys. That is the guys going out to recruit sources, living in weird places overseas, viewed as the tough guys, the guys who are out late at night trying to clandestinely meet a source and informant, versus the people like me, the headquarters guys, the pointy-headed guys. You're supposed to look at all the data, all the paper, and try to come up with a composite picture. The two sides got along, but the philosophy, the, the sort of characters, the cultures are fundamentally different. With, as you mentioned, in 1986 and going beyond, the Counter-Terror Center had a different philosophy. In the past, those two sides, the operators and the analysts, didn't sit together. They could even – sometimes you could not meet an operator without going through a badge machine. I mean, really. <laughs> After uh, the creation of the Counterterrorist Center, revolutionary, people said, well, the equivalent of the engineers and the salespeople, they're sitting next to each other. That was, especially after 9-11, a remarkably risky 
but also uh, bore a tremendous amount of fruit. When the CIA got more tactical, the analysts would look through the data and tell the operators, here's where your target might be, and then the operators go out and try to figure out what to do. That partnership was critical, but it did not exist for most of the history of the CIA. Now, one of the things that you say is that the CIA was not prepared to build a prison system to detain these newly caught terrorists. Uh, we had never done that. And that, of course, led to some of the outsourcing and the offshoring and the black site, which is the title of your book, Philip Mudd. So tell us about yeah. that, because there were a lot of new expectations put on the CIA. There were. After the capture of the first prisoner in the spring of 2002, when the CIA decided they did not want to send that prisoner to, a, to the U.S. judicial system because the prisoner would presumably immediately get a lawyer and never speak again about either threats, about people he knew. So when the CIA said, we're going to go down the road of detaining and, and interrogating prisoners ourselves, classic move by the CIA. They had never done it before, but they pride themselves on A, agility, we move fast, and B, on doing stuff the other people don't want to do. We take on ugly tasks, ugly jobs. So putting these two together, like, well, we haven't been prisoners. Uh, we haven't held prisoners before. We haven't interrogated prisoners, but we're agile. We take risk. We're going to do it. So that led to the decisions to build the first prisons. There were a lot of mistakes, as the book outlines. There was a lot of maturation going into 2003 and 2004, but the first weeks and months were unsteady as the CIA did something they had never done before. All my friends who I interviewed talk about it and say, boy, we were not quite ready to get into this, but we didn't think anybody else would do it. But after the fact, of course, we had a lot of questions. Why did we do this? Should we ever do this again? Uh, was this legal in terms of international standards? But you show us that really throughout your book that everything was deeply thought out, every single step of the process. You guys were really working hard internally uh, to find the right balance here with all the pressures that the politicians and the White House and others were putting on you. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, there's a lot of people who look back today and question, you know, whether what happened reflected American values. A lot of people don't think what happened at the CIA, although, although views across America are mixed, uh, that what happened at the CIA was appropriate. Other people, and I continue to talk to them today, say you guys should have done that and more. Again, every organization that evolves, the first stages of the, the secret prisons were rough. Then people started to learn from experience, including mistakes. Training. Training wasn't that good. There are some people involved in the program at the outset who should not have been there. They were too aggressive. The lawyers, and they were excellent, A+. Plus. The lawyers started to get involved to say, we're going to start giving you more and more clear and clearer guidance, exactly what you can do and can't do. When you make a mistake or when we have conversations, we will codify that in procedure. That maturation at the CIA took years not a couple months, years for the program to really become more effective and more appropriately managed. But when we do look at it, there were a lot of intervening events, uh, Abu Ghraib, uh, tensions within the CIA headquarters about what was going on. How would other countries look at us? Will they take these prisoners? I'm sure congressional oversight was something that you were beginning to sense was coming on. So tell us all the pressures. Uh, that the CIA began to feel based upon what had happened in those intervening years? There was a lot of unity early on. If you go back to post-9-11 in September, going through the spring of 02, and for that first year or so, America was unified in, 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 in a really great way. The politicians were unified. Forget about the program, the sense that we had a, a purpose one single purpose and going after an adversary that everybody agreed had to be taken out. But as you point out, that eroded quicker than most people would have anticipated, primarily because of the Iraq war. Politicians started to become more and more partisan in the debates about the Iraq invasion. The publication of the photos from Abu Ghraib, that was not a CIA program, but people got it confused. And then they saw the horrific photos of what was done illegally to prisoners of Abu Ghraib was devastating, I think, for America. And then the biggest piece, what we called endgame. As you mm -hmm. say, people as early as 0203 in the CIA starting to say, we can't hold these guys together forever. How do we get a reluctant political group in the White House to start telling us what we're going to do with these prisoners when we're done extracting intelligence? 
that got tougher and tougher as time moved on and people asked more more questions about what the CIA was doing with prisoners. That got really tense. The book is called Black Sight, the CIA in the post-9-11 world. Philip Mudd is with us, former deputy director of the CIA Counterterrorist Center. And Phil, I think a lot of people want to know, at the end of the day, uh, the value of the information that was gleaned from these enhanced interrogations. And they might be surprised at some of the tactics that got the most pushback. You say it wasn't necessarily, for example, waterboarding, but it was more nudity for prisoners. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I, I would actually put sleep deprivation at, at the high end of the list of tactics. And again, I'm not arguing for it against it. The book is tried to try to explain what happened, not to try mm. to defend it. What happened over time was CIA had a, started to gather a vast amount of information about Al Qaeda. So you could walk in the room with a prisoner. That prisoner would not know what you knew and start asking questions, some of them quite detailed, about Al Qaeda. And you would know whether that prisoner was compliant based on how they answered the questions. So people ask me all the time, did you get anything of value? They must have lied all the time. Like, it's harder to lie when the, when, the de when the interrogator already knows the answer and the detainee starts to say, boy, I better start speaking. These guys know a lot. And every time I lie, they seem to know it and life becomes more difficult. So the tactics were tough. Waterboarding was very rarely used. There were 100-plus prisoners at CIA facilities. Three of them were waterboarded. Sleep deprivation was far more common. And like it or not, effective. People speak when they're tired. They want to go to sleep. So the, the interrogators, this is not me speaking, would say, we can do without waterboarding, but there are other techniques that work. Now, even going into 2006, people started, even four years in, started to say, we're not sure even those for the American people are going to be palatable long term. By 2006, the program was on its last legs. And when we say last legs, I mean, do you think that um, this is it, that based upon the experience and how quickly you say uh, the scrutiny came on and the program began to deteriorate, can you see a circumstance where these kinds of measures would be reemployed, or do you think that's the last that Americans have had for uh, what the program offered in a very critical and very unusual time in American history? I'd go with the latter. I can't see that circumstance. My view, and I'm reflecting also, I'm trying not to be Philip, but I'm trying to reflect. Many of the people I spoke with have never spoken. They will never, never speak. On a lot of issues, they were one of the surprises, not unanimous, but pretty uniform. There was a mix of responses. I did ask virtually all of them, do you think this will ever happen again? There's a final chapter on ethics and reflections. I don't think it will ever happen again. And, but that's misinterpreted. Typically, an audience will say, well, then you must be embarrassed by this. Or you must think that what happened was wrong. There's a simpler explanation. Vitriol that the CIA faced, the attacks from the Senate, some of the questions from the American people, even investigations into some of my colleagues from the Department of Justice, criminal investigations. Any leader in the intelligence community who would say, I'm going to take this path again, knowing that five years down the road or 10 years down the road, my workforce might be subjected to that kind of backlash again. It's not that people regret what they did. It's that they know that the appetite of, of the American people for this kind of thing is not strong and that minds change quickly in this country. So I, I cannot, and I'm 57, the chance this happens in our lifetime is very low. On the other hand, you end the book with uh, a simple line, we won, uh, the last words of the book. So yeah. if we won, uh, as uh, difficult and at times uh, distasteful, uh, why would we not necessarily go back to these uh, tactics again? Because I think those of us who lived it said we have now the luxury of understanding what happens in an experience that was unique for America. We did not have that luxury in the spring and summer of 2002. So mm -hmm. based on what you learn over time, the tactics, and I think, were successful in terms of extracting information. But based on what you learn about how the Senate will eventually react, if it ever happens again, how the American people might, how the workforce might be investigated by the Department of Justice, you can say – what we did might have been a tiny piece of what prevented a second 9-11, but you can also say we're not going to do it again. How important was John McCain in, in all of this? Uh, because, uh, again, I'd like to your comments on the value of the information gleaned from enhanced interrogations. Uh, if we didn't have them, 
and if we didn't have the black sites uh, around the world, uh, what would that have meant to the program, to the CIA operationalizing all that it did? McCain was important, but he was not a member. He was briefed as a courtesy because of his experiences in Vietnam. He was vocal in opposing what happened, but a lot of other members in, in the Senate and the Congress said this is okay. If the black side program, I mean, I've talked to people about this, hadn't existed, how critical would that loss of intelligence have been to the war? I don't know. My colleagues differ. Some of them say it was highly important. None of them says it was insignificant. Some of them say it was modestly important. Whether we would have proceeded in the war the same way without them, boy, I'll never know. That's the, that is the fateful question. Phil so, Mudd, now as the program has waned, what does cleanup look like? I mean, what are the issues that we still have to grapple with? People might have forgotten the status of the Patriot Act or prisoners at Guantanamo. Give us an update as to where we are. I think there's a couple issues you have to think about. The, the prisoners are, at Guantanamo are significant. There's an ongoing, up to today, there's an ongoing debate about whether, from their defense attorneys, about whether the, any evidence from them collected by the FBI after the CIA program should be admitted, because their attorneys obviously are saying anything after the CIA program that they talked about should be inadmissible. In terms of the long-term prognosis for another program like what the CIA did, I don't think that's outstanding uh, an outstanding issue to Congress, and, and I think CIA officers have said pretty much this won't happen again. I do think there's an interesting question in terms of the aggressiveness, not, not of the program per se, but of how the CIA pursued terrorists after 9-11, about how people today want to pursue right-wing extremists in the United States and potentially left-wing extremists. I think what we learned in the years after 9-11 should educate that debate. We'll see if it does. I'm not saying uh, we'll see. What about to some of these high-value prisoners? Are they still awaiting trial, uh, extradition? Uh, can we expect any more headlines from all of this? I don't know if there will be headlines. That uh, People have forgotten about Guantanamo. But there, there are a couple of basic questions. I think there will still be prisoners who will be tried. The, the question remains about whether there will be a few who can't be tried because there's insufficient evidence for a court of law, but people will still say they are fundamental to al-Qaeda, and therefore they, they can't be released. I mean, you're still talking about a few dozen down there, and some of these are really the core people who were involved in the 9-11 attack. So they're never going to get out anywhere. The question is whether we're still hearing echoes of 9-11 in trials that happen in the coming years. I mean, th this is going to live with us through my generation for another decade or more maybe. What about mending any fences with any of the black side allies who took uh, various prisoners? Has there been any political blowback in any of those countries? Or if we ask them to do something again along these lines, uh, what do you think their response would be? There has been blowback um, in, in some areas from uh, particularly human rights organizations or organize, organizations outside non-governmental organizations, in some cases governmental organizations that investigating how those countries cooperated with the CIA. I, I can't mention the countries, but in some cases you should be able to figure it out. I think in the future, I, it's hard to imagine a, a program of this sensitivity, but if someone were to walk into one of those governments and say, hey, there's another high-profile, high-interest program for the White House that we'd like you to cooperate on, but it's extremely sensitive. You can't talk about it, and there might be blowback down the road. It's hard for me to imagine those countries saying, hey, that's a great idea. We trust you that this will never become public. I, I, that's, hard to, that's hard to imagine. And if counterterrorism is less of an emphasis today, what is the role of the CIA going forward? Has it reverted to pre-9-11 more intelligence, less operational activity? Uh, we don't hear an awful lot under this new director, uh, but just tell us uh, what is going on there. A lot of juggling going on. After 9-11, obviously, there's only one target. We, we forgot about the Russians. We forgot about the Chinese. Not entirely, obviously, but everybody was talking about counterterrorism. If you look at today, you're right in pointing out that there's not a lot of conversation about counterterrorism, but you've still got to look at counterterrorism operations in places like Africa and Yemen, and you still have to look at what's going on in the Middle East. That said, traditional espionage. Think about the big targets that people would worry about today, North Korean missiles and nukes. Russian intervention in American election, what China is doing long-term in places like the South China Sea, 
within the past year or so what Saudi Arabia did in terms of the, 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 the murder of a journalist in Turkey. There's still big questions about what traditional – I forgot to mention Iran. There's big questions about what traditional – intelligence targets Iran, uh, Russia, China are up to, and that means going back to the roots of what the CIA has done, developing informants, sources, what we used to call, in countries where you want to know what they're up to, getting away from counterterrorism and focusing on classic espionage. We do hear the Trump administration ballyhoo the fact that they've given so much money to the Defense Department. What about intelligence? I mean, is that a priority for this administration? Typically, I mean, I I don't know because that budget is typically secret. I've got to believe that as the defense budget increases and with the with the focus on national security budgeting from the White House, that CIA budgeting is comfortable. That said, if you look at the president's criticism of the national security, the intelligence infrastructure, I'm particularly talking about the FBI and the CIA. I I wouldn't guarantee that he's giving them uh, enough money to get by, but again, looking at the public face of national security, the defense budget, I'm I'm guessing they're not pinching pennies these days. And so we have taken our eye off the ball, and you talked about the domestic threat today and the rampages that we've seen. Do you think we have too much uh, taken our eye off what's going on? I was reading an article the other day about ISIS two. Uh, forming, and that al-Qaeda, one expert told me, has just been morphing into a different organization than it was before, and it has been more focused on the Middle East than the United States. What do you think? Have we taken our eye off the ball? I would characterize it a different way for both foreign and domestic. I wouldn't characterize it as taking your eye off the ball because the people that I, I, I worked with, and some of whom I still know, whether it's on the on the domestic right-wing groups or whether it's on al-Qaeda or ISIS, the talent and the ability to look at these groups is pretty good, especially given the revolutions in intelligence after 9-11, not just money and people, but the ability to look at technical information, for example, in the digital age. The question I would really have is how much does the government want to do? How much stomach is there to infiltrate right-wing organizations in the United States? How much stomach is there to participate in the civil war in Yemen to try to ensure that al-Qaeda doesn't get more space to operate in Yemen. The, the, the agency and FBI guys are good at chasing terrorists. The question really is how much money and time do you want to spend on some of that stuff anymore, given that you've got a lot of competing issues these days and the terrorism has declined. Well, Phil Mudd, I want to thank you so much for your time in this great book, Black Sight, The CIA in the Post-9-11 World. Very, very important for us all, and I thank you for being with us on America Trends. And thank you for putting me through my paces today. I feel like this is like one of the tougher interviews I've done, so I need to take a nap. Thanks for for talking to me. Thank you so much, Phil. Pleasure. America Trends podcast is part of the MHNR Network, mhnrnetwork.com.